Okay, uh, we have started uh, recording. So thank you so much, uh, Dominic, for uh, uh, accepting my invitation. So um, here, these are Frontiers students uh, uh, in uh, advanced uh, uh, modern physics. And uh, Dominic is a, a PhD student, finishing uh, PhD, uh, his PhD soon, maybe within a year, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, in, uh, in black holes and event horizon telescopes like so. Uh, he uh, uh, is doing such a great work. Uh, New York Times uh, uh, took uh, his interview and you can search Google uh, on what is the new perspective of uh, on black hole black holes like so uh, he's working in uh, uh, in black hole initiative program at harvard university right with that i would like to request uh, uh, dominic uh, to uh, share uh, the presentation probably i need to uh, allow their screen uh, and now you should be able to uh, share your screen and by the way dominic also gave uh, uh, i invited uh, dominic uh, 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 for uh, on uh, on uh, sigma pi sigma induction ceremony uh, in the spring semester, and Dominic visited here, gave a very nice talk. So, Dominic, with that, uh, I would like to request uh, uh, to uh, present uh, on black holes. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, thank you, Rudra. Uh, so, my name is Dominic Chang. Sound is okay. Are you sound is okay? Uh, yes. Uh, are you Are you hearing me? Oh, okay. Good. Good. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so so my name is Dominic Chang. Um, I'm be just talking about black holes, but particularly the EHT sources. So I'm going to be talking about the two primary sources for the EHT. Um, so yeah, I'm a physics student at Harvard University. I'm a member of the Black Hole Initiative and Event Horizon Telescope. And at the Black Hole Initiative, we have this program called the Black Hole Scholars, um, where you can get one of the scientists here to come and talk about their research. Uh, so if anyone, you know, wants to schedule a talk from anyone at the BHI, uh, be it me or someone else, in the future, you can just give us a contact. You can go on the BHI's website and, and, and just uh, make a request there. Okay, so the first question I'm going to ask uh, is, does anyone know what a black hole is? And it's okay if you don't know if uh if it's okay if you uh like we j I just like to hear a guess of what you think a black hole is even if you don't know. An object of infinite mass. Um. Yeah. So that is a feature that is present in a lot of black holes, but it's not a defining feature of a black hole. But that that is a that is a good good uh, statement. Sorry, my my sorry, something happened to my video. I, I'm gonna stop sharing for a second and reshare. Yeah. Okay, are you seeing my screen again? Yeah. Okay. Um so a black hole is uh a region it, sorry it's a black hole is a is a region with gravity so strong that not even light escapes so it's just like is this region of space time that's totally entrapping and anyone know what's a special feature of light anyone know like why why we always talk about the speed of light in physics care to make a guess like why why is the speed of light so special Speed of light is so special because nothing can go faster than the speed of light. Exactly. Nothing can go faster than the speed of light. So the speed of light is like the universal speed limit. And since nothing can go faster than the speed of light, and not even light can escape the, the, uh, a black hole, that means nothing can escape a black hole. So so a black hole is this region in space time where once you get entrapped, there's no escaping. You're, you're just like, you're stuck within that region forever. Um. So, you know, because light can't escape, that seems to imply that we can't see black holes yet we have pictures of black holes. So what's going on? If, if, if we can't see the light that leaves a black hole, how do we see a black hole? So the, the, way, the reason we can do that is because black holes leave effects on their environments. So in particular, the, we look, you know, we look into space, there's, there's thousands of years of astronomy here, and you see evidence for black holes all over. Uh, from the formation of galaxies, 
from these relativist like in well this is not the milky way we can't actually see the milky way of course because we're in it but uh, if we could see the milky way it looks something like this so um from to relativistic jets so this this the second image is of centaurus a um and you can see there's a this galactic plane and these these ga gaseous jets that are being launched orthogonal to the gas to the um galactic plane so the, remember this is like many kiloparsecs long so in order to have something to shoot off that much mass that much matter at that speed you need something truly massive and powerful and we think that is uh the only thing that can power that are supermassive black holes uh, you also see evidence for black holes in galactic formation. So this is a young elliptic galaxy, ESO 325G004. And the, the dynamics that defines formations are believed to be controlled by supermassive black holes. And black holes are believed to grow in tandem with the, with the stellar mass around it in that galaxy. Um, and so in particular, we'd like to, uh, the thing, the point I'd like to uh make to emphasize that black holes launched these very very powerful jets in fact these jets were one of the reasons that we first started to suspect that there were supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies um black holes also act like nature's funhouse mirror because it warps because it warps space and time it also warps light as it travels through it so this is just an image to show how things would look like if it was worked by a black hole. The top image is this JWST deep field image that I've just kind of inclined um, at the 85 degree angle. And the bottom image just shows what would happen if you placed a black hole at the center of that plane. So you start, so you see a warped image and you see the rear of it go above the plane and, and below the plane. So you end up seeing actually multiple images of, of that disk. Um, and if any of you want to play along, um, see what you look like if you were lensed by a black hole, I made this little um, filter, this little image filter where you, if you just go to that website, uh, it uses your, your camera, your phone camera, your laptop camera, and then it shows you what the what you look like when you, you worked with a black hole. Uh, the thing that's interesting is that, of course, like the black hole is weird, so you form multiple images. One object will form multiple images, and in here, this was one of our interns uh, who was uh, volunteering to to show this. You can see that there's multiple images of him being formed, and they all sort of get closer and closer uh, to the black hole shadow. Okay, so now that we uh, talk, know about black holes a little bit more, let's talk about some of the conclusions. So the first thing uh, is that we can observe black holes from their effects on their host galaxies. The second thing is that black holes sometimes generate very powerful relativistic jets that can punch through galaxies. And we see these on the kiloparsec scales, on very, very long scales. Um, and the third thing is that black holes warp their appearance of their environment through an effect called gravitational lensing. So it, this is the, the statement that black holes are nature's funhouse mirrors. Um, so the conclusion is that we, the strong conclusion is that we cannot see black holes, but we can see their effects on the environment. And we know what effects to look for because we understand black holes very well mathematically and thus we can predict them. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the EHC's two primary, uh, primary uh, uh, targets. These are M87 and Sag Sagittarius A star. Uh, some M87 is a supermassive black hole so that's somewhere in the Virgo galaxy. It's in the M87 galaxy. Sorry, it's M87 star and M87 is a galaxy. And Sagittarius star is, as the name implies, also in the Sagittarius uh, cluster, in the Sagittarius constellation. Uh, but this one is actually in our, our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. So first I'm going to talk about M87. Uh, so we have observations of, oh, sorry. Let me go back. Uh, so we have observations of M87 on many wavelengths. Uh, we've been looking at it for centuries at this point, actually, or a little bit more than centuries at this, or more than one century at this point. Um, it's been first seen in the optical. That's just because the jet's really, really bright. And you, you can actually, with a sufficiently powerful optical telescope to see the jet uh, in at optical wavelengths. But of course, you know, as time has progressed, we've developed telescopes that observe in the electromagnetic spectrum 
at different wavelengths. And this has allowed us to see M87 um, at different length scales. So different wavelengths allow you to observe M87 at different length scales. And one thing that's kind of interesting is that at first, when you're looking at M87, you start to get this self-similar behavior in the jet structure. It's very highly collimated. And as you zoom in and zoom in, it looks the same. But after a while, you start to see that collimation break into this parabolic shape. And once you get very close to the core of this jet, so whatever is the core of this engine that's powering this jet, you see this donut uh, that's formed. There's just this hole that's there. And we think that's uh, evidence for the supermassive black hole that's lying at the center of M87. Um, the other uh, black hole that we observed is Sagittarius A star. And the history for this one's a bit different. So does anyone know, um, I think it was the 20, oh geez, I think it was, a, I think it, was, it might have been the 2020 Nobel Prize that was awarded to Andrea Ghez. Does anyone know uh, what that was for? So, so that was for uh, the experiment that proved that there was evidence for a supermassive compact object at the center of our galaxy. And the way that she did that was that she just basically took a telescope and looked at the stars at the center of the galaxy and tracked their motion over some periods of time. And so this is a video that can, that shows uh, multiple images uh, that she took of the stars at the center of the galaxy um, over time. So each white dot is a star and you can see that they're kind of zipping around. You see, in particular, if you look at this star, the star is uh, S2 you can see it moving around some invisible object. In fact, all of them are just kind of zipping around this invisible object. And be mind, these stars are huge. These stars are 10 times the mass of our sun, and they're moving at like near the speed of light very quickly, like by 0 0.1, 0 0.5 the speed of light. And you can see that they're moving large distances um, over a period of a decade or so. Uh, so the the only thing that can do that is something really really massive. You know, if you if you they, they, you need something really really massive that's just there anchoring the gravitational potential well, such that the stars can move around in the kind of in the same way that our so that uh, planets move around in our solar system. And the only explanation for that is probably something like a supermassive black hole, especially since we can't see whatever it is that's moving around there. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned before, Andrea Ghez won a Nobel Prize for this work. This is just um, a, an animation showing those trajectories. And essentially, what this tells us is that there should be some supermassive object sitting right there where the star icon is that we can't see. Something is there that we can't see. OK. So just to, just to summarize, Sagittarius A star is this black hole that's at the center of our Milky Way galaxy. Um, if from Andrea's work, if you see the trajectories of the stars, you can actually use Newtonian mechanics uh, to calculate what the mass of uh, Sagittarius A star must be because you know how quickly those, those stars are moving. And if you back out that calculation, you get that it's like something at like 4 million times more massive than the sun. So it's, it's, it's really big. It's 10 to the 6 times more massive than the sun. It's really compact. And the other thing is that because we know it's in our galaxy, we can calculate how far away it is. Uh, and we with astrometry, and this gives us uh, a tight uh, distance measurement, and we know it's about twenty seven thousand light years away. Uh, the other black hole is M eighty seven, and this one is interesting. It's roughly the same size on the sky, but it's actually six mil billion uh, more massive than the sun, uh, times more massive than the sun. So it's actually a thousand times more massive than Sagittarius A star. Uh, uh, but the reason it's the more uh, roughly the same size on the sky is because it's also about a thousand times farther away than Sagittarius A star. So it's about 55 million uh, light years away. And just to put that in perspective, uh, again, M87 and Sagittarius A star are roughly the same size on the sky. But if you put them beside each other, you, you can see just how much more massive M87 is. So this is just a video to show that. This is, this is kind of what they would look like from far away. And if you were to bring M87 closer to you, such that it's at the same distance as Sagittarius A star, you know, it'll take up more, more space on the screen and it it'll end up just being absolutely massive. It's just, it's just Sagittarius A star pales in comparison to the size of M87.
Okay, so 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 let's talk about M87. Um again to drive home how massive this thing is. Um this is this XKCD comic that uh came out shortly after the HD published its image. I think it's really cute because it just shows it, it really gives you a sense of scale. It's it's really hard to kind of understand distances on astronomical scales. Uh, you know, the Earth is already big. The moon is really far away. So that's even harder to understand. The solar system is, is massive. And then on top of that, we have things like Voyager 1, which we put very far out, like way outside the, the, the boundaries of our solar system. And then there's things like M87. The shadow of M87 is so large that you could neatly fit the solar system and Voyager 1 within it. It's it's like it's 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 really massive. It's it's kind of hard to describe how big it is without just having something there for comparison in order to put it to scale. In, in fact, if any of you guys have seen that movie Interstellar, um, the move that black hole Gargantua, you know, the, the black hole that's so big that they call it Gargantua is actually smaller than M87. It 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 in like it's it's kind of interesting to think about because it really does seem to uh, be that reality is stranger than fiction. Okay, but of course, M87 is really, really far away, so it's really, really small on the screen. It's 55 million light years away. Um, so here's a question. Uh, given that we know the si the mass of the black hole, and we know how far away it is, anyone care to guess what size of a camera you would need to see Sagittarius A star or M87? So be in mind, like, you know, if you want to see something that's really, really small in your field of view, you need a really, really big camera. So anyone, anyone care to make a guess? Yes, I would have been here. Uh, so I guess probably it is anything that has a million individual cameras, but all of them together are like placed all around the earth. So it would be your So, so, okay. So how many, let's have, how, how about a show of hands? How many people say A? As big as a car. Okay, how many say B? As big as a house. That seems like that seems like most people. So how many people say as big as a city? A couple of hands. How about as big as Earth? One hand, two hands. Okay, so the answer is actually D. It's it's as big as Earth. <laughs> Um, and we can we can calculate that. Uh, it's actually a really simple calculation. So uh, a back of a back of the envelope calculation. You can you can if you learn about the Schwarzschild radius, that gives you an estimate for the size of the black hole. Uh, the shadow radius is roughly root twenty seven, so that's three root three times the mass divided by its radius uh, by the distance uh, times c squared. So we know the mass of Sagittarius A star. Um, that's four million solar mass. We know its distance. That's eight. Uh, 0 0.1 kiloparsecs. Uh, and that if you just plug that into that formula, that gives you an angular diameter of roughly 52 micro arc seconds. So the angular resolution you need for that, it would be if you're standing on Earth and you took a picture of the moon, in order, you need the resolution to be able to resolve something of the size of a grapefruit sitting on the moon. So you need like a lot of resolution. Uh, and what that boils down to is that you need some a camera with an aperture roughly the size of the Earth. So someone mentioned earlier that uh, the the HT put telescopes basically everywhere around the Earth, and that's because you can essentially you're going to use the Earth as your aperture in order to capture um the picture, the light coming from Sagittarius A star or from the stuff around Sagittarius A star, which each telescope being like a pixel, like a like a sensor on that on that aperture. Uh, so so where this size comes from is is with is from this thing called the Rayleigh criterion. If you guys ever do optics and waves, you'll see this pop up. And it's just, it's just, this is kind of a rough estimate, but it's basically saying you have two circular aperture apertures, or if you have a circular aperture looking at two point like sources, what is the minimum distance separation between the two point light sources until you can resolve them? Uh, and the reason for this is because um, the, the, the presence of the aperture just inevitably causes some spread in the waveform. So a point light source will just image to a blob, kind of like that, uh, that video showed earlier where we're looking at stars, you know, they're very far away. So they're, they're essentially point like sources, but they, 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 they end up imaging as some, some blob. So there, that, that means there's some minimum separation that the stars can have before you can resolve them. Uh, so in particular, the HT uh, observes 
things in the, at millimeter wavelengths. So that's at radio wavelengths. We know the radius of the source from the previous calculations, about 20 micro arc seconds. And that gives us a Rayleigh criterion diameter of 11,000 kilometers. But the diameter of the Earth is 12,000 kilometers. So this is how we know that we need something roughly the size of the Earth in order to see Sagittarius A, A, A star M87. Yeah, so that the answer is D. <laughs> uh, congrats to the to the people who said D. Um, yeah, so and of course we don't have Earth size cameras, so we do this with the EHT. So the EHT is this collection of telescopes with sites all around the world. And the telescopes observe, we, we it's sort of like an organizational feat, um, a logistical feat. The telescopes all point to the same source in the sky at the same time every year to do an observation. We collect that data and from that we form an image. Okay. So in particular, uh, um, the EHT is, has, I think as of now it has uh, uh, 11 sites. Um, at the time when we first did our observations, I think we only had seven or eight sites. We have more than 300 members now. I think when we first did observations, we had about 250. Um, and the observations that we get, because essentially all the telescopes just turn and point in the same direction. They just collect all the photons that they get and they record that information. A single observation, which is about eight hours, can generate petabytes of data. And it's so much data that we that we have to, it, it's sort of easier to describe them by the weight of the hard drives in which we store them. So it's like half a ton of hard drives. Each observation is like half a ton of hard drives. Um, and of course, like transferring that data over the internet would be would take forever. It's like really slow. So the data transfer, we we just we just have to physically transfer those hard drives uh, from place to place. So it's sort of like the, the transfer speeds are kind of determined by air travel speeds. We, people literally just get on planes with half a ton of hard drives and fly them from one location to another so that we can correlate them and, and, and uh, form that image. It's, it's kind of interesting because... Uh, I think if you if you learn how a camera works, you realize there's a lot going on on under the hood in order to form an image, and it's kind of a similar thing that happens with this with with the EHT. Okay, so um, I I like to emphasize again that the EHT is like this this group of uh many scientists. You know, there's a diverse group. It's just a picture of us during um last year's conference in Taichung. Um, uh, so you know we're from from all over the world. Um, I think every continent is represented, if you include the, the folks on the SPT in the South Pole, that would include Antarctica as well. Um, so lo lots of fun there. Okay, so back to this camera analogy. So again, I, li I like to emphasize, or I like, to, like you guys to think about the EHT as a telescope, and to think about that telescope as if it's a camera. Um, so the, 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 sorry, the, the way how the camera works, how a traditional or how a digital camera works is that it has an aperture and then the aperture bends light and focuses line on a screen and a sensor. And on the sensor, there are pixels and the pixels just stores color information, just stores the information from the photons that hits it. So if you have a, a 4k camera, that means you have 4,000 pixels. And each pixel is just arranged on this grid and it just uh, stores whatever color information it gets. And when you, when you want to see the picture that you took, it just reproduces that color image on some sort of screen. So the EHT is doing a similar thing where instead of um, you know a grid that the pixels sit on, we have the entire earth and the, the telescopes are the pixels sitting on the earth. But of course, we don't have telescopes that cover the entire earth. We only have telescopes that sit at fixed locations on the earth. Um, so we can't really take a picture in the same way that the camera does. So instead, we use this technique that's called uh, very long baseline interferometry, um, where, where each of the telescopes that are sitting on the Earth kind of communicate each other and correlate information that's coming from uh, other telescopes that are looking at the same source at a given point in time. So uh, I, I, I throw out this term, very long baseline interferometry. Uh, does anyone know what that is? <laughs> yeah, it's sort of this, it's sort of this niche thing. It, it's, it's actually this uh, technique. Uh, I, don't, I don't remember the year. 
uh, that it was first, it was somewhere in, sometime in the 1900s, I believe, but it's this technique that uh, has allowed for these high resolution images in astronomy to be formed, especially with radio astronomy. Um, here's a description of how it works. So we all know that light is a wave, right? Um, so the, th the thing about waves that's interesting is that you can sort of analyze waves either in the frequency domain or in the time domain. So if you, if you, if you look at waves in the time domain, you just see o oscillations with amplitudes that change over time, or you can break that oscillations up into specific frequency components through a technique called a Fourier transformation. And that tells you what, what, um, that tells you what, uh, I guess, pitches or sounds associated with a frequency here at a given time. So with the image, we're doing something that's called like a 2D Fourier transformation, but the analogy between the image and sound is very similar. So it, it, this, this, this analogy is actually pretty um, useful, especially in industry. The, this Fourier transform technique is often used for image compression techniques and algorithms, even that, especially uh, with uh, YouTube and uh, Instagram and those things, their image compression te te uh, algorithms essentially take Fourier transforms or a, a section of the techniques involves taking a Fourier transform and uh, using that Fourier transform to compress information. Uh, so the, the way how the HD works is that instead of seeing each pixel and seeing the information from each pixel, we see frequencies in the Fourier domain. Okay. So there's this analogy for how VLBI works. Um, which I really like. It involves ducks. So there's this this, uh, <laughs> this idea of learning interferometry from ducks. And there's this question you might want to ask yourself, like suppose you're sitting on the bank of a, of a pond and, some, and you're observing some ducks that fly into the pond and you want to look at the wavelengths, like the, the water undulations that hit the side of the pond and guess how many ducks you're seeing and how far apart they are from that water oscillation. Okay, so so let's look at two sorts of situations uh, as an example. Let's consider one situation where the ducks are really close together and another situation where the ducks are really far apart. And they're kind of like kicking their feet and bobbing up and down as they're doing this. So in the, so in the first video, I'm showing what happens when, you know, the ducks are bobbing their feet and they're really close together. You get waveforms forming and they propagate out to the boundaries of the water. And remember, we 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 want to ask this question: of where the ducks are, given the the undulations that we see on the edge of the pond. Now, here's a similar thing: when the ducks are farther apart, again they propagate out to the water, and we get undulations um, again on the on the boundary of that pond. So, the question I want to ask you guys is: what? differences do you see on the waveforms on the boundary of the pond in the case where the ducks are close together that being on the left versus far apart that being on the right like what differences do you guys notice when the ducks are closer together it's a bit more uniform it looks like one duck is flashing while when they're further further apart it looks like it's less uniform yeah that's exactly right so Fourier transforms have this feature where large, or this sort of property about them where large scale features in sound or large scale features in images end up getting transformed to the high frequency modes in the Fourier and domain. So in particular, because the ducks were really, really far close together on the left, so they, they correspond to small length scales, it gets transformed to long wavelengths in the Fourier domain. So you see big, you see long waves on the boundary. Whereas when the ducks are far apart, those correspond to long wave uh, length scales, which give, ends up giving you short uh, wavelengths when the waves propagate out to the boundary. So this is essentially the, the how VLBI works. What that means is that telescopes that are really, really close together can see large scale features on the sky and telescopes that are really, really far apart can see small scale features on the sky. So essentially the, the, the sort of is aligning with this intuition that the aperture size uh, tells you the resolution that of 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 your camera because the farther the telescopes are, is the smaller the scale of the feature that you can resolve. Um, so so th this I mentioned before that th this was a a technique that was done sometime in the nineties. In particular, it was first uh pioneered by Martin Ryle, for which he won a Nobel Prize in nineteen seventy four, and this has been uh, essentially like a, a very useful technique 
uh, for astronomers for looking at these very distant uh, objects because it allows us to resolve things on these scales. And this is essentially the technique that we use to look at these supermassive black holes. Okay, so in, in, with the EHT, we had um, seven telescopes. And if you guys are good at combinatorics, I mentioned before that you need two telescopes to form a baseline. So that means the number of baselines is seven choose two, which ends up being 10 baselines. So we observed uh, M87 with essentially 10 baselines. So instead of having seven pixels, we, we kind of have more like 10 pixels. But again, like 10 pixels is not enough to form a camera. So how do we like get an image with just 10 pixels? Uh, well, the, the, the well, there, there's a little bit of a, of a, uh, oh, I'm not sure if this, does this audio play? Oh, this. Okay. It says that there's a little bit of a, a, a game that's going on. Essentially, you don't really need all pixels in order to all like, Fourier information or pixel information in order to recognize the image in the same way that you don't need all notes in order to recognize a song. Um, hopefully you guys recognize this song. I, I, so I'm gonna play a game and what's going to happen is that I'm going to play a song and I'm gonna add one note at a time. And when you guys recognize the song, I want you to put your hands up, okay? All right, uh, so hopefully you can hear this. Wait, can you hear this? We can't hear that. Oh no, okay. Uh, I see. Uh this might be so while sharing properties you need to share is it often share sounds or something? Oh. <clears throat> Can you hear it now? No. I think you have to reshare. You have to reshare. Okay. Uh, how about now? Oh, I see. I the share sound turned off when I reshared. Um, I see. So. Uh, how about now? Are you hearing it? Can you hear it? Hello? Sorry, I can't. Are you hearing the, the, uh, no, no, no. no. Um, Okay, I'll I'll just try one more time and uh actually it's kinda interesting. I'm not hearing it. Um okay, I, I'm not sure why I'm not hearing it. Yeah, okay. I'm I'm not hearing my own video for some reason, so maybe there's something wrong with the video. Okay. Um Okay, so well, yeah, so it, the, the point was that you can research to recognize the song without all of the instruments in the same, all of the frequencies in the same way that you can sort of, you know, play a song and just play, you can remove some of the instruments. So it, it, essentially like removing some of the frequencies and still recognize that song. Um, but the, the EHT also has this extra game that we play, uh, which allows us to make up for extra pixels. And it's this technique that's called earth aperture synthesis. And essentially the idea is we make the earth the earth's rotation a part of our instrument. So this image is telescope uh and at sorry what? 
Problems. Can you guys hear me? You're like freezing. You're freezing a lot. You have connection problems right now. I think that just crashed. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
And if you know, if you guys remember anything about magnetic fields, I did the magnetic fields give generate acceleration that's orthogonal to, to magnetic field. So if a particle moves across a magnetic field, it gets accelerated orthogonal to the the, the field line. Uh, so what happens is that these particles are really hot; they're ions. Um, they generate a magnetic field. Uh, the ions sort of like couple to the magnetic field, and as the magnetic field, as the ions are accreted into the black hole, the magnetic field gets wounded up. Kind of like, and then kind of like a sprinkler. And then, you know, like the sprinklers that spin and they shoot water out. And uh, because the magnetic fields also couple to the particles, they kind of get shot up along the magnetic field lines. And then they, they get shot out from the tops of the, from the poles of the black hole. Okay. Great, thank you. Uh, somebody also raised hand. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, one more question. Uh, does a black hole die in a sense or like decline to the point where it's no longer observable? And yeah, so it's kind of interesting because uh, there's, so there, there's, you can calculate a lower limit for which you expect uh, black holes to be formed through natural processes. So typically the smallest black holes you'll see will be on the order of like three or five solar masses uh, because anything smaller than that will form like a neutron star or a white dwarf. Um, and like quantum effects will prevent it from collapsing any further. Um, and those black holes tend to be really, really bright. So you see those as like quasars and blazers. Um, just be, and they, they, sometimes like they'll swallow up a star and like they'll, they'll just be really, really bright. Um, and then they, the, what happens is that, and, and you see a lot of these small black holes, especially, you know, in early galaxies. And then something weird happens, which is that they, they sort of grow and they become what I call intermediate black holes. And for some reason, those intermediate black holes aren't very bright. Like they don't have much stuff around them. Uh, so you don't really see them. Uh, and then at some point they get bigger and they become these the super black holes, a star, and they start just, you know, they're sitting at the center of galaxies. So there's like a lot of stuff being funneled to the center of galaxies and then they become bright again. So it, it's kind of weird because you know, we see them, then we don't see them, then we see them again. Uh, it, so it's, it's not really that they, they die, but they sort of like turn off at some point and then turn back on. Good. Uh, 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 has one question. Um, are there plans to make like new sites for HT? And do you know where and when they're going to be made for as far as what you yeah, so there are plans to extend the EHT. Um, there are two proposed projects. Uh, there's one which is called the NGHT for Next Generation Event Horizon Telescope. And that the, 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 the goal of that project is basically to put a bunch of small 10 meter dishes um, all over the globe to basically fill in more of the aperture. Uh, there's one that I believe just got approved for the Canary Islands. There's another one going on Mount, Mount Jelm in Wyoming. Um, I think because there's already a telescope up there in Mount Gemini, Wyoming, and uh, I, I don't remember how many sites, but it's going to increase the number of sites by quite a bit. Um, another proposed project is one that my advisor is leading, which is a space extension to the Event Horizon Telescope. So this one's called the Black Hole Explorer, and that one will launch a space VLBI um, uh, telescope up so up into space that will be on some elliptical orbit. And that will uh, help give us uh, extra baseline length to, to look at MH7 Sagittarius A star at uh, higher resolutions. Uh, okay, and now probably this is the right time to stop. Thank you so much, uh, Dominic, for giving this uh, beautiful presentation. Uh, hopefully, uh, uh, the class uh, got some idea about the supermassive black holes and they're amazing. Let's thank Dominic one more time. Thank you. All right. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, I will be sharing this uh, 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 in the course website uh, uh, when the Zoom does processing. Uh, I think that will be okay, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, have a nice day. By the way, Adam, uh, okay, let me stop recording. Uh, The stop recording thing. Oh, wow. so
Eso, eso, eso. 